Yeah, your family needs leadership, and so does the sports team that you're on, because there, someone's going to have to step up and rally the troops, and someone's going to step up and take a stand and stick their neck out, and that could be you on the sports team, and periodically it will be you, be somebody else, and at work. But I'll tell you, when we're finished doing that, somebody's going to have to clean up, and someone's going to have to shut lights off and turn the lights off. Someone's going to be the last one in the room, and there is a leader. The leader that says, yes, I'll stick my head out, and I will take leadership, and I'll speak. But if someone's got to roll up the sleeves, I'll do it, and I'm okay with it. I like it. That's the Apostle Paul, and that's so much of what we can adopt with him. He uniquely called himself a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Take a look at this next one. This is really hard. This is a really difficult one because it's a, it is an amazing run-on sentence. How many of you grew up with an English class where you had to diagram Okay, let's just, for fun, how many of you have no idea what that means, to diagram a sentence? You know, you, will you admit it? Okay, thank you very much. It's the young people like Mark over here. Well, Mark actually sat through the class as they talked about it. He still just doesn't know what diagramming is. Is that what it is? It's where they put the sentence in uh, on stilts and they... You had to know all the parts of speech, and so they diagrammed it all out. In seminary, we had to diagram a third John. And I did really well with it because I got an English teacher. That's what I secured, was an English teacher to diagram that for me and with me, and it was really difficult. Well, this sentence is really difficult. The King James is even more difficult. They've tried to clean this up through translations to make this a little smoother. Maybe you caught on when I was reading the introduction when your eyes rolled back because you're like, this is just keeps going and going and going. Well, that's what's happening. King James reads this way, Paul, a bondservant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness, comma, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, comma, promised before time began, comma, but this in due time manifested his word through the preaching which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Hmm? Huh? Here's one of the problems with it, why <clears throat> everyone struggles with it, and why we would have trouble right now with it. We have in our English language 150 prepositions. Preposition gives a relationship from one thing to the other. Um, the communion trays are on top of the table. Um, the pastor keeps snacks under the communion table. Um, the pastor is standing on the stage. The meeting is after the service. Those are prep. We have 180 prepositions in English. The Greek has 18 of them. So one word in Greek could be under, over, after, before, beside. You have no idea. You literally have to read the sentence and think through the sentence, and then the sentences before and after to think, what would the preposition be? What do they mean by that word? That's very difficult. And it's in this, and specifically with one word, which makes it challenging, and that is found in the end of verse 1, which accords with godliness. Paul, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of truth, which accords with godliness. 
of faith and knowledge resting in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the ages began. This, so I, I gave it in a formula for you so you could see, and you look at different translations, and many, many of you do that, and you can do it free online, which is the best, is you put in parallel Bible. So I just pulled up eight translations on the one verse. And so some of the phrases are, it's faith of God's elect, knowledge of the truth, which leads to godliness, which is after godliness, which is like pursuit of, it's according to. This, this phrasing of his is so good for us. He's speaking of the faith plus knowledge which leads to godliness resting on the hope of eternal life. If it's faith, faith in God, relationship with God, our knowledge and increasing knowledge of Him that leads to godliness. And the only reason you'll do that, faith, and grow in knowledge and increase godliness is because of the confidence and the hope that we have of eternal life. And you say, okay, not rocket science. Yeah, it actually kind of is because we often reverse it. We have so much emphasis on godliness and we'll tell students or young people but it's all of us, it's all ages, where we're so focusing on you shouldn't do that and you need to stop this and you need to start doing this and that's a bad habit and that's a bad pattern in your life. We're so much focused on godliness and we take so much abuse for it from the church that when you and I take abuse because your language and the way you dress and the way that you, what you drink and where you hang out, you guys stop all of that. The focus is on that, which then, because you're good hearted and you like the people, you're like, okay, I'll start fixing it. And your focus is on fixing the godliness. And it's exhausting. And then we find out it doesn't work. That's legalism. Well, how do you change godliness? How do you increase godliness in somebody's life? A faith in eternal life, relationship with God is, is a gift from God through faith in Jesus. I have assurance of eternal life. I have my faith in Him, in increasing knowledge of Him. If you and I are about that, it produces godliness. So you take the kid who you was know, a good kid, but struggling with everything else a, a kid struggles with. There's temptations and there's all sorts of attractive things that are probably not a good idea, and they know it's not a good idea. What does that kid need? That kid needs somebody to help them focus First, assurance of eternal life. Then focus on faith in God and growing in that faith and intimacy with God and grow in knowledge of God. And as that vibrancy of a relationship with God takes root, it blossoms into godliness, which is lasting. But we train people the other way because we're so quick to point out the sin. Oh, you shouldn't do that. And they're like, okay, I'm going to try not to. They really try hard not to do it, and they're having trouble, so the obvious next thing to do is I'm going to hide it. So I'm just going to make sure you don't see it. I'm not proud of doing this. I don't want to live this way, but you keep 
pounding me about my behaviors and my lack of godliness, and I'm struggling with actually being that way, and I just keep getting hounded, so I'm going to do it privately, and I'm going to try to keep it secret, and to the point where finally i got to get away from people that are constantly pointing out problems in my life. You don't think I know that? You don't think I know where my problems are? I don't need people to set the standard for me, which is impossible for me to keep. I don't need that. And our young people don't need that. What we're in desperate need of is people to throw arms of love and compassion around and help mentor the relationship and growth with God and the vibrancy of passionate relationship with God in His Word, exercising faith and growing in knowledge. And we all are celebrating that. And then we just kind of sit back and keep that accountable. Keep that accountable. And then it blossoms into godliness. I don't know if you grew up in a setting where it was all focused on godliness. But it's exhausting. Well, let's, let's actually, because this is can be fun. The target changes also. The description of what is godly by a church changes over time also. And it depends on what fellowship you're in. You can't do that. Oh, I didn't. Oh, really? I can't? I, that's, yeah, that's horrible. That's bad. You shouldn't do that. Okay. Well, 10 years later, that same church is saying, oh, no, that's fine now. I mean, how many of us grew up where, honestly, you could not go to a movie theater? Yeah, okay. You guys, you had that too? Well, then, wait a minute. How did that change? So then in that era that movies were horrible to go to, then all of a sudden we were able to bring movies home on a disc of some sort. And churches are like, well, that's okay. And we go, wait a minute, how is that okay? Is it the size of the screen? Is that the problem? That is actually a fair question. The reason why is because it was silly to begin with. You're promoting the wrong set of godliness. I'll tell you what is true is we should never put things in our mind that are immoral. That is absolutely true. And I don't care if it's a book or it's talking to somebody over a coffee or going to a movie. The problem isn't the venue of movie. The problem is the content And so, yes, we'll speak to the content of things that are wrong, and we want to teach that because that's part of knowledge of God, those things that God loves and likes and those things that God does not love and like. That's part of growing in faith and knowledge. But it's through that growth in relationship with God that all of a sudden you actually stop liking those things. How many of you experienced that in your Christian life where something that you enjoyed doing that was not godly early in Christian life, that God changed your heart for it, and now you're like, oh, I would never want to do that because I've changed. How many of you, there's something like that? I'm not going to ask you what it is. That is so purely Apostle Paul introduction. It's faith and knowledge resting on eternal life Ah, vibrancy and time alone with God and prayer and he's teaching me things and there's a warmth inside and I'm starting to actually love him. I'm starting to actually want to talk to him throughout the day because it's passionate. It's a relationship. And that cleans me. It cleans away dirt. It cleans away things that I never even knew I had that was wrong. I always thought was interesting if, if I were to name to God right now what my top three sins are. I would love to hear an, an audible voice of Him 
to then name what he thinks my top three sins are. I'm actually pretty confident that they're not going to be the same. Because I think I'm so much of a sinner that I really don't even understand the extent of the sin or what sin affects things most. I think there's a, there's a tinted vision and view of that. I'm so dependent on faith and knowledge and let Him point things out. As a church, we're welcome to point things out because we do it out of love and compassion. So we can still do that. But I'm not really trusting that point of view as being that which is most damaging to me. I trust Him for that. And then to sit with a trusted friend over a coffee and say, hey, I've been spending time in my faith and knowledge, resting on eternal life, and God's revealing to me that I have this. And I want a friend to say, interesting, I don't know if I would have pointed it out that way, but I think I may see that in you too. Really? And now they're partnering with me in faith and knowledge towards godliness. It's not pointing. It's embracing. And I'd say, can you help me with that? Can you help me get through that? Look at this last one. We're going to go into a time of communion in just a moment. But take a look at this last one. It's just, I think it's just touching. Remember, it's, uh, it's author, recipient, and greeting. Those are the three in an introduction. So here is the recipient to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Like of all the Cretans, uh, liars, um, evil beasts, I think, isn't that what it said? <laughs> That'd be awesome. Be known for that as a community of people. You're, you're evil beasts. So, and lazy gluttons. But Paul has a focus on people. It's interesting at the end of a lot of Paul's letters, he has lists of names that we skip past because a lot of them we can't pronounce, right? Those names. Paul's big-minded. Paul was a part of this revolution of Christianity that has changed the world, and yet Paul was also about individual people. There was a woman who came up to Charles Spurgeon at the end of one of his messages. Spurgeon uh, preached in the 1800s, was, is still known as the Prince of Preachers, actually died at age 57. He wasn't an old man, so he didn't have a lot, and yet he pulled off a lot. And a dear woman came up to him after service and said, I just feel called, I just feel called to ministry. And so he, he said, well, tell me about your family. Tell me about your life. She goes, well, I'm the mother of 13. And he says, oh, dear Lord, not only are you called to ministry, he's given you a congregation. <laughs> and he said, there's your people. That's your crowd. Paul was very conscious of the fact that when he came up with somebody, that he was working individually and personally with people, and you and I are never beyond that. Who are you influencing the most? Oh, positively. Because <laughs> you have a unique set of friends. Nobody has your unique set of friends, that circle. Is that being worked as I have them to influence? I have them to encourage. We ask questions, do, do people walk away from me relieved and exhausted that the conversation is over? Or do they leave with a little extra spring in their step? Like, I was able to lift them up a little bit. 
I was at Starbucks uh, last week, and I happened, I was sitting in my car on my phone for something before I went in, and I saw this, this car uh, pull up, and it was a, um, we'll just say an impressive sports car, and um, it was Italian, and I happened to notice it. So I went in, and I noticed he came in after me, and so I knew what he was driving, and he was really dressed down. I mean, it was jeans and whatever, and so I'm like, hey, how you doing? And he goes, oh, good, good. Hey, great day, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it's, it's a great day. He goes, good day to drive. And I'm like, yeah, any day would be a good day to drive that, <laughs> you know? He wouldn't say what the car was. He didn't know I knew. It was so funny. I said, oh, yeah, what, you, you drive a nice car? He goes, oh, I mean, I'm just saying it's a good day to drive. And I'm like, okay, I can get you to say it. <laughs> I can get you. We literally talked for 10 minutes, and he never told me the car that he was driving. I don't know if he just realized that he set himself up and he wasn't going to bite or something. And we left, and that was really, I'll be honest, that was the reason I talked to him, because I was just curious and whatever. He left so happy. He's like, hey, tell me your name. He left as John, and John leaves, and, and I thought afterwards, I went, well, I didn't do it for the right reason. I was just curious in the car. But he actually left pretty happy that we chatted like that. Paul was that way. He's not just about the crowd, but man, could he handle a crowd. It was more than that. Paul was actually about individual people the names he would throw out that we don't know even to this day who they are, but we just see their names listed. Let me read you as we end this portion and we then get into communion. Uh, there is one description listed of the Apostle Paul. No one knows what he looks like except one description. It was the second century uh, A.D., so 150 years after the Apostle Paul, and it was fiction. So no one really knows, but the poor guy, this is what it's stuck with, is a book called The Acts of Paul, second century. He was a man of middling size. His hair was scanty. His legs were a little crooked, and his knees were projecting. He had large eyes, and his eyebrows met. His nose was somewhat long, and he was full of grace and mercy. And at one time, he seemed like a man. At another time, he seemed like an angel. The only known description of the Apostle Paul. Well, from the introduction of Titus, we also learn that he was a servant and a messenger. That he was about the right process confidence, eternal life, faith and knowledge, that's what leads to godliness. And he was also about the person, about people. I don't know which of those three might be most encouraging to you, but I would encourage you in your notes, just put a little mark and say, I'm going to think about this one this coming week. Paul's an amazing one to imitate, but Paul is also the imitator of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Once a month we do take time to celebrate Jesus through communion, through the cup and the bread. And right now we're going to go into that time. I'm going to ask the guys to just come on forward. If you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and you're walking with Him, this is for you. doesn't matter what church. This is not ALBC's table. This is the Lord's table. And as we celebrate the Lord's table together, as it goes by, take and just hold on to it. We'll eat and drink together. If you don't know that you have a relationship with Jesus, you might want to let it pass. If there's some unconfessed sin that you're struggling with, you may want to let it pass. But we do this, as the Scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians 11, we do this in remembrance of Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we're gathering right now, we're asking that your Holy Spirit would warm our hearts as we celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for us. 
possibly the only calm, quiet moment we have all week right now as we sit comfortably and remember and think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray this in His name. Amen.